a Revelation chapter 3. Brother George called me this week, had an answer to my question about the idea that when Jesus went into the lower parts of the earth, and by the way, I wrestled a lady down in Las Vegas last, last weekend. And I mean, talk about Jezebel, Jezebel spirit. She's got it. And I, Thursday, I, I talked about the book that she wrote. And it was called, Who is God? Well, she's got it wrong. I'm telling you, she's got it wrong. Because she believes, she, she claims to be this Hebrew Bible expert. And um, she's, her claim was that God reincarnates. In other words, you die out of this body and depending on what you did, he judges you and then puts you in another body for you to pay for the, the crimes or the sins or the bad things bad behavior that you did or whatever in the previous life. And this is what made me mad. Well, there was the fact that she kept telling me to shh. <laughs> I'm talking. I'm not done is what she did to me. So, um, what... What bugged me was, you know, when Brother Sam came here and showed those kids and told about how these guys, these rich mafia guys in India, these mobsters, gangsters, organized crime people in India would grab these lower caste kids, just grab them, steal them, and then sell them uh, or give them away to some temple to be sacrificed for their sins. See, the reason why they're, they believe that they are on a lower caste is because they believe in a past life they didn't do so well, they did bad things, and so whatever they got in this life, they deserved it. It's called karma. And karma, don't, don't ever... Don't ever, you as a Christian, don't you ever adopt the phraseology that's in this world about karma. Don't do it. Karma teaches you that you, you get what you put into the universe. If you put negative things into the universe, you get negative things back. Don't you ever adopt that as a point of biblical lifestyle. Because that emits or omits grace completely the fact is you didn't get what you deserved because of grace amen you've gotten far better than you've deserved far better and uh, she so she's a believer in karma and she said people that are born in you know under dictatorships or under Muslim extremism where they're tortured and killed and used and abused and even children that are abused. They, that's probably because they lived a bad life before that and they're just getting what they got coming to them in this life. I, that made me so mad. And that's, that, that is not God. That is a result of the wickedness of sin. What people do to other people. Now God always has a loving salvation plan to rescue people out of... I don't care what kind of bad thing that you went through. God always has a loving plan of mercy to pull you out of it. That's our God. And do you get it because you deserve it? Because you finally lived a decent life? No. You get it because of grace. Because God put his love on you. And you trusted in Jesus Christ. And I, that woman just did not... 
I mean, I wasn't mean to her by any stretch of the imagination, but she gave me, to prove her point, she gave me a, a copy of her book. It was about this thick, and she put a bookmark in the chapter she wanted me to read. So I scanned that chapter, and I gave it back to her the next day, and I said, I've scanned it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read through it carefully. And um, I didn't give Thursday when I presented this, I didn't give half of what of what was in there, but it, it was bad enough. Um, it is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. So, Brother George, um, I asked this question about when when Jesus died and went to the lower parts of the earth, did he take the keys of hell and death from Satan. And George, your answer was from Hebrews where? 2.14. 2 so turn to Hebrews 2.14 very quickly. And I can, I, in, in a way, I can kind of see, um, it doesn't use the word keys, doesn't use that language there, but this is, this is a true doctrine. This is a true belief from the Bible. Um, by the way, Mom, you remember Rob, Dr. Robert Piccarelli? He came to this church years ago. He was, the, he was the big Greek doctor at the Bible College, okay? And I read an article by him. It's probably been 15 years ago plus where he examined, he did a re-examination of the Greek text of the Bible and he no longer believed that Jesus went to the lower parts of the earth and preached to spirits in prison. And I'm going, he didn't believe it anymore. And he, I don't know how you can't believe that because that's exactly what the Bible says. That he went, Jesus said, as Jonas was in the whale's belly three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be where? In the heart of the earth. And Peter twice Twice Peter mentions what Jesus was doing down there. He was preaching to, uh, to the spirits in prison. It says in another prophecy that he, he went down there to set captivity free. So he's letting loose all of those who are in Abraham's bosom and he's preaching to those who are in hell where the rich man was. You're, you're staying here. You're going to burn for another 2,000 years and then we're going to let you out. We're going to give you a brand new body and then we're going to throw you in the lake of fire you're going to be judged and that's how it's going to turn out for them um but um hebrews 2 14 in fact let's back up a little bit just to get the the gist and the context of it let's go to verse 11 for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one it means christ and us are one together we're one body He's the one who sanctified us. We are the ones who are sanctified by him. So we are one uh, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. I love that verse. Jesus is not ashamed of us. Amen. Even though we might be ashamed of us or might be ashamed of ourselves. He's not ashamed to call us brethren. That bother him a bit. Um, so he says, I will declare thy name in, unto my brethren in the midst of the church. Will I sing praise unto thee? I just read that verse one day and I shouted. Because I thought, boy, won't it be glorious to hear. I thought about Jesus singing. If, if, you, if you like music, like I like music. I like a good singer with a good vocal. I can't wait to hear Jesus Christ sing. Because that's what it says. He's saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church. Will I sing praise unto thee? Jesus is going to sing with us. And I can't wait to hear that. That brought tears to my eyes. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children which God hath given me. For as much then, here's the verse, as the children are partakers of flesh and blood... He also himself likewise took part of the same. He became flesh and blood that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. 
So I, I guess it's by a, a, an extrapolation where they extract the idea that if death has a key to it and Jesus went and destroyed the one who had the power of death, then possibly he would have, he would have had a key to death. Is that what you were kind of thinking when you read that? Okay. So it's, it's an extraction, I guess, of that. Uh, because I really, again, I really have not found another verse or any place, whether in prophecy or whether in just, you know, one of the Paul's doctrines, letters or Hebrews or Revelation or in typology itself where there is a picture of someone taking the keys from someone. I, you know, I just don't see that, but I guess, I guess that kind of maybe is where some get it. So it's not a big deal, but anyway. All right. Revelation 3. Last Sunday we were talking a little bit about uh, replacement theology. I'm going to spend just a little bit more time there this morning, then I'm going to move on. Uh, Revelation 3, verse 8, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Now, take your Bible and turn to Romans 11. Part of this we looked at, uh, we kind of hurried through some of it. So I, I just want to go over then, uh, do we actually replace Israel completely or does God have a future salvation plan for at least a remnant of the Jews? If you were here Wednesday or you heard Wednesday night's message, I showed you a little bit of the typology of the feeding of the 5,000. How that Jesus said, gather the fragments that none remain. And when they had gathered the fragments, they had 12 baskets full. 12 is a number that points you either to the 12 tribes or the 12 apostles. Either way, it points you to that idea that God, that Christ gathers them together so that they are not lost. They are all spread out. Right now, the Jews are all split up. They're all spread throughout the world. Even still, even though there's a homeland, a Jewish state, a Palestinian state for the Jews, um, there's a home now, a nation that the Jews can go in and live in peace. Um, they are still scattered throughout the world, and at some point, God's going to take a remnant of them, the fragments, and he's going to gather them together once again in the last days. Um, and Revelation 7 portrays that. And we have, I have that in my notes, but we probably won't read that this morning. Um, so in, Revel in Romans 11, look at verse 12. If the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? So right now, because God has, has cast off his people temporarily, you and I as Gentiles are enriched by that. Because God is not dealing with Israel as a nation, as a people, he deals with individual Jews or individual Jews that get saved. That was made clear in the days of, uh, of, of the, the early church. You had Jews getting saved. Originally, it was all Jews getting saved on the day of Pentecost. Those were Jews there. But slowly, as time went on, less Jews are getting saved, more Gentiles are being saved. And finally, it got to the point to where Paul said... I'm not going to another synagogue as long as I live. I, every time I preach there, they hate me. They want to have me killed, arrested, or whatever. I'm done. They won't listen. 
They're, they've stopped their ears. They, they are exactly what the prophet said about them. They've made a covenant with hell and with death. And so they don't think that there's anything wrong with them. So, um, so he says that the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles. That's us being enriched with salvation. How much more their fullness? In other words, if they're brought back, how much more enriched will the world be? And that's a true statement. Verse 13, for I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, meaning the Gentile world, the rest of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? And here we would bring in the story of the Shunammite woman whose child died and Elisha the prophet laid on him and breathed into him and the child sneezed seven times. Seven's a number for perfection. It shows forgiveness of sins. It, the seven things that God said he would do in Daniel chapter 9 and they all had to do with the forgiveness of Israel's sins. So he sneezes seven times. The, the dry bones. This is where the fruity lady at Las Vegas. This is where primarily, Gary, she got her doctrine of reincarnation. No, I'm going to change what I, I'm going to change, I'm going to unsay that. She never read the Bible and got the doctrine of reincarnation from it. She read Kabbalah, she read Hindu, she read the Bhagavad Gita, she read all these New Age things, she read all these other religions that already believed in reincarnation, and then she went and jammed that into the Bible, is what she did. But she claims that the story of the dry bones... And how they were brought back together again and sinew was connected together and then the skin covered them but they had no breath. And then he prophesied again the second time and the breath, the, the four winds blew breath of the breath of life into them and they stood up a, 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 an army unto God. And God said, this is the army of the host of Israel or something like that. She said, God reincarnated them. Put life back into new bodies, new flesh bodies. And I went, no. And she went, Shh. I'm still talking. Mm. But that's where she says she gets it from. And I almost didn't want to, um, to say all that. Thursday because I would not want a weak, unstable, unlearned young Christian get led astray by me even sharing what this woman believes, um, thinking that maybe she's right, maybe it, we do go through reincarnation. No, people, listen, it is an appointed unto man wants to die. And after this, the judgment. And see, she lied to me. She said two different things about that verse because I quoted that verse to her. And while she was talking to me, she said that verse was added in later by the evil, early, church, patriarchal, uh, woman-hating priest of Rome. And I went, no, ma'am. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine. Holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Boy, I mean, she did not want... But in her book... Yeah. In her book, she used that verse. She used some weird translation of it. And said that it is appointed unto man to die... And after this, the judgment, she said, that proves reincarnation because after each death, 
God judges you and how you spent that life, he then puts you into a new earth flesh body. And I went, yeah. I can tell you there was words going through my mind that I was going, Shh, Mike, don't say them. Don't call her that. Uh, it, was, it was incredible. It was. Uh, then I met a guy. I've, and see, this is why I went. I met a guy. He is a, a mutual UFO network investigator for the state of Texas. He investigates UFO sightings for the state of Texas. I said, you, you had big coverage. He said, yeah. And you know what he told me? He said, I started out believe, as a believing Christian and skeptical about UFOs. And when I began to research UFOs, I became a believer in UFOs and skeptical, skeptical about Christianity. And he said, I now refer to myself as a Gnostic Christian. Gnosticism was was one of the, the, one of the big heresies going around during Paul's day. When Paul said, we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, there were, he knew there were already people who were writing gospels, quote unquote, by men who had not written a gospel, like Peter, uh, uh, Thomas, uh, Judas Iscariot, Mary Magdalene, there are, there are gospel texts that have been found, 1945, called the uh, Nag Hammadi Library. They were found in these clay jars, and they have been preserved for some 1,500, 1,800 years. And they're, they're fake, phony gospels. And I said to him, I said, sir, just but out of respect, those Gnostic gospels contradict the four gospels that are in the scriptures because those gnostic gospels deny the literal appearing of christ in flesh and blood body and i don't remember what he said after that but i as soon as he walked off i said lord let him watch those DVDs. Let me reach this guy. Let me, let me restore or you restore this man's faith in the word of God. Because he had been clearly, he had clearly gone off on a different path. And he's lost. Maybe God can save him. Maybe God can bring him back to where he believes the word of God. That, that's my hope. Uh, but anyway, back to what was we talking about here? Um... Verse 15, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? And that's the dry bones idea. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. Uh, when it comes to a root, the book of Job said, and I'm going to paraphrase this, I don't have it memorized exactly. But if there is hope, there is hope of a tree Though the root and the stump be dry, that by the scent of water it can have life again. And I love that. There isn't anybody, well, there are some, but some of the people that you think have backslid and probably won't ever come back, maybe they just need a little water to revive that root again. Amen? Amen? Maybe that's what they need. Okay? So anyway, and that's, I believe, all of this points to Israel. For, so verse 17, if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, were graft in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. In other words, the natural branches. Do not boast against Israel by saying we have replaced Israel. Do not do that. Because if God didn't have a problem taking them off of the tree, he's not going to have a problem taking you off. You're the wild olive branch onto the gospel tree. Um, 
boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. We're not maintaining Christianity. We're not the ones keeping the, the old ship of Zion afloat. Christ is. He's the one keeping us afloat. We're not the one that's being the blessing to the tree. The tree blesses us being branches. Amen. So he said, verse 19, Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. And I run, have run into uh, my share of high-minded people before who thought they could never be brought down as Christians. And God said, oh really? Watch what I do. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he spare, lest he also spare not thee. Verse 22. Uh, Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God. On them which fell, severity. But toward thee, goodness, if. And the word if is there for a reason. If thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. In other words, if the Jews want to believe, God's going to graft them back in again and restore them. Otherwise, uh, uh, God is able to graft them in again. Verse 24, For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. And something that the Jews were ignorant of. God had a secret. God had a secret all through the Old Testament. And the secret was that rock that followed them in the wilderness, that rock was Christ. That lamb that they, that they slew every day of atonement, that lamb was Christ. That Passover lamb that they killed and ate and spread blood, sprinkled the blood on the doorpost and the lintel. That, that Passover lamb was Christ. Moses, the one who led them out of bondage, that was Christ. Joshua, the one who led them into the promised land, that was Christ. You have a secret all throughout the Old Testament and the Jews never figured it out. But now it's explained to us by way of the word mystery. And he says, beloved, uh, I would not... Um, let's see here, where was I? Verse... Help me find it here. Verse 25, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness, in part, is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, and shall be is the key. There is a future salvation coming for Israel. Don't replace them. Make room for them. Because they're coming. And God's going to save them. There is a, uh, all Israel shall be saved that is as it is written there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins and I think I think the the beauty of some of the stories in the Old Testament bear that out the story of Ruth and Naomi Ruth is the Gentile wife of the kinsman redeemer who gives birth to a child but then hands that child to Naomi. Naomi then takes that child and raises up seed to her dead husband so that she can, and her husband or her son, can have the inheritance of the land back. 
And that's what Obed, or Boaz, did. Boaz, through the Gentile bride, gave birth to a child who then belongs now to Naomi so that Naomi could raise him up. He could be the inheritor of her dead husband and her two dead sons' inheritance. And now the, he the inheritance be not lost. Now they're going to get it back. But it took a Gentile bride to deliver that. We are that Gentile bride. Uh, you have other stories in the Old Testament. Jacob and Esau, Rachel and Leah. You have uh, uh, Manasseh and Ephraim. All of which were exchanged one for the other. Whereas you have Esau as the firstborn. He's a picture of Israel. But he gives up his birthright to the secondborn son, Jacob. Jacob then takes it. But his father says to Esau, when his dominion is taken off of thee, then you shall receive your blessing. And I believe that means that when we leave this earth, Israel is going to receive their covenant promise once again. When the child of promise has come, Israel is going to receive it once again. All right. Now back to Revelation chapter 3. If the bell doesn't ring. Revelation 3.10. Jesus says to them, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience. What does that mean? You've kept the word. That means that while all the other churches are moving away from their Bible. Somebody sent me, I don't have my phone on me, or I'd read it to you this morning. They sent me an email. They've made a, they've made a new Bible. And it's for, it was written for indigenous Native Americans or First Nations. That's what they call them up in Canada. They don't call Canadian Indians Native Americans. They call them First Nations. And they... They took a group of men that represented the, the various tribes of North America and they wrote a New Testament for them that's based on the ways that Indians tell stories. See, Indians never wrote down their beliefs. They never wrote down their 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 religious beliefs or their doctrine. It was all transmitted by storytelling. Well, how many different ways can you tell the same story? Hundreds, hundreds of different ways. And I, I wish I had brought my phone out here. I would read to you what they did to John 3.16. It bears little to no resemblance to what John 3.16 says. But because it appeals and appeases the Native American or First Nations people who demand we won't believe anything unless it's done our way, then they cater to that and they rewrite the gospel. Paul said, though we are an angel from heaven, bring you any other gospel, let him be accursed. And it's just part of the floodgates of new Bibles that are coming in. F Bibles that are now catered to every lifestyle and every way of life so as not to offend anybody. So what's next? A gospel for the Jews that eliminates the cross and Jesus as the Lamb because that would offend them? Guarantee you something like that has either been thought of in the works or they're going to come out with it soon. But if you take out of the Bible everything that could possibly offend everybody, then you don't have a Bible. And maybe some people need to be offended and get good and mad so they can take stock of their life and understand that God... God has done everything He's going to do for mankind by sending His only begotten Son. What more can He do if you refuse that one? Somebody say amen. Father, bless Your Word this morning. We thank You, dear God, for the Gospel. 
And Father, it's not the white man's gospel. It's everybody's gospel. For your word says that it was from all nations, kindreds, tongues, and tribes surrounding the throne of Jesus, saying Hosanna to the King. And Father, we are thankful, dear God, that we heard the gospel and we believe the gospel. Help us, dear God, to spread the gospel wherever we go. Use us for your kingdom and your glory's sake, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.